Okay, we're here for our weekly Board of Commissioners meeting. It is Wednesday, June 16, 2021. Uh, we're, it's at 9 a.m. and we're here in the Senator hearing room. And as always, we start with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you'll join us, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Wow, got to start out this morning up at the lake, and it was beautiful, and then you get to say the Pledge of Allegiance here. It's a pretty cool way to start your day, huh? All right, so we do have somebody set up for uh, public comment. I haven't seen this guy in a very long time. David, you want to come up? Where did I just see? Oh, I saw you over at the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, Groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. I was there. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah. Welcome. The, the mayor asked me to come, so I did come. Good. Uh, this I like to see a little bit more funding for the for healthcare policies for Marion County on the emergency backup system for the healthcare. Because a lot of them, uh, disability people can't go to the doctors and are afraid of the shots. So I was thinking. If we can get 70% of Marion County disability people get all the shots and the families in Marion County, or 80% for Marion County, for get everybody the vote, um, go to go to the doctor and get the shots twice. We do get a. And the problem is, a lot of them can't get nowhere because because no, we don't have any Sunday service for them on this problem. So I like to see the county work on that. For next uh, next session, and the next uh, the next governor thing too, because I think we need a policy in there on a uh, healthcare policy. Because a lot of them disability people can't get nowhere. For I think we have we should have Sunday service full time, not one time services. Because a lot of them can't a lot of them will work, and a lot of them can't get nowhere because got no no Sunday service, no emergency stuff. So. That's what I like to see done on well, the health care policy. Put that in. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to see you. Thank you. Nice seeing you too, everybody. Thanks, Thank Thanks you. David. Have a good day, David. Thank you. Okay, nobody else signed up for public comment this morning. We're going to go straight into our presentation, and I believe um, Chad is going to give us the update today. Welcome, Chad. I love it when he's here. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm much. Never mind. I'm not going to make it. Yes. <laughs> We're really glad you're here. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, Welcome. Commissioners. For the record, uh, Chad Ball with the Board's Office. Um, for today, we have 13 uh, new or 31 new COVID cases. Um, we've had 23,320 total COVID cases for the whole pandemic, with 322 deaths. Um, our positivity rate is at 8.5 for the pandemic. Um, for the last two-week period, 5.30 to 6.12, we've had a 5.7 test positivity rate with 121 cases per 100,000, which is about 420 cases for the past two weeks. So we've definitely been seeing it go down. Um, COVID-19 cases continue to decrease in Marion County by about 20% over this last two-week period compared to the previous two-week period. And the state saw about a 17% decrease. So we're a little above the state when it comes to that. Uh, the bulk of our cases are continuing to come from the Central Salem area, Northeast Salem and Brooks, Woodburn, and the Kaiser Zip Codes. Uh, Marion County remains in the high-risk category. As of today, we vaccinated 59.84% of all residents. We need about 14,000 more people to get the vaccine before we reach that 65% threshold and we can move down to low um, risk. Um, as we all know, once the state hits 70%, Governor Brown has said she'll lift all restrictions that are currently in place and we're at 68% um, vaccinated for the state. And that is about 65,484 more people needing the vaccine for the state to hit 70%. Um, so that's about a total of 2,330,000 Oregonians that have received at least one dose of the vaccine, and about 2,054,000 are fully vaccinated. Um, our declining case rates, hospitalizations, and deaths are evidence and of the effectiveness of the vaccine. Uh, very few people currently hospitalized with COVID-19 have been vaccinated, which aligns with the data about how effective the vaccine is. 
Um, we encourage everyone who's interested still, who may not have got the vaccine, to go speak with a healthcare provider, speak with someone they trust about the vaccine. Um, there are a lot of places you can go now. You can call 211 or visit covid-19.mchealthy.net to find a vaccination clinic near you. Um, once you've been vaccinated or if you've already been vaccinated, uh, please share your story. You can share it on our Facebook, share it with your friends and family, um, the reasons why you've done it and, and why you feel it's important. So that's it for today, unless there's questions. Good. Hey, Chad, not to put you on the spot, but... Um, <laughs> but to put you on the spot. Uh, yeah, I should have asked you this ahead of time, but I, I, in following up with uh, uh, Mr. Beam's um, public uh, comment, um, can you share a little bit about the uh, mobile vaccine units that we've stood up and some of the places that they've been? Yeah, so there are a lot of uh, different clinics throughout the, air, uh, the community right now, and the best place to find them is covid-19.mchealthy.net. Um, we're posting updates all the time where those are. Um, we've kind of shifted from the larger, you know, fairground style clinics to going out into the community, trying to bring it on the weekends, different hours of the day. So they are out in the community right now. Okay, good. Thank I think you. in addition to that, the pharmacies are open on Sundays and um, like in the grocery stores and they have a fair amount of vaccine that's available. I would highly recommend David promote that throughout his community so to go to Safeway, Rite Aid, Walgreens, so yeah. forth. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you could walk there because I think David's comments was that buses aren't running on Sunday and, right. and that's something we don't really control. But um, yeah, that's a good point that you go to a pharmacy in your neighborhood, typically. Call them first, I would imagine. Yeah. And, yeah. and some taxi providers, Uber, Lyfts, they're trying to give discounts or free rides if you're going to go get a vaccine. So there are options on there. Again, we have that on our website as well, some of the transportation opportunities. Perfect. So. Good. I wonder if it's a need for Chris's team to work with uh, Katrina's team to do some promotion within that community specifically around connecting resources, ride share, et cetera, to those pharmacies on Sunday if that's the most available day for them. Okay. You could pass yeah, that along. That'd pass be great. Along. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Chad. Thank you. And it's good to see you. <laughs> Always nice to be here. Okay. <laughs> Gee, I, let's see. I think you did consent last week. I didn't know you did. Because I, I wasn't I was, here. Yeah. You were doing some really special stuff last week. I was. So we'll let you And do I'm it. actually really excited to do this consent because it's I mean all short. of it's great, but item fine. number one I mean it is short, but item number one is kind of a big deal for me. Yeah. So Mr. Cherry moved to approve the consent calendar. Um, under item number one, community services, approve an order to create a community youth wage grant program. Item number two, under information technology, approve a purchase agreement with Mythics Inc. in the amount of $248,310.09 to provide Oracle software licenses, support maintenance, and technical support through June 30, 2022. And item three, under the tax office, approve an order designating the Woodburn Independent as the newspaper for publication of the 2021 tax foreclosure list. I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I just want to say uh, thank you to Tamara for taking this idea and running with it so quickly. Um, this was a suggestion from a local farmer in the St. Paul area. It mirrors a program that Lynn County has had for more than 20 years to promote um, youth ages 14 to 17 to get a job. Um, employers can apply for this program and we're going to work with Willamette Workforce Partnership to administer the program. And basically, um, an employer can apply, they have to meet certain qualifications, and then they can receive back up to $4 per hour for the student as they work for them between May and September um, of this year. And I really appreciate the three or the two of you saying yes to this. We set aside $40,000 for this season to be able to promote that opportunity. And it's not specific to ag. It can be any industry, any, any employment opportunity for youth to engage. So thank you. I think it's a great program. I think getting, getting kids work experience is super important, super valuable. And it's harder and harder to do um, nowadays. So thanks for bringing it up. Good yeah, job. my daughter starts her first job today <laughs> at 4 o'clock. She's going to work at Gambaretti's. So be nice to her, folks, when you go over there. <laughs> She's going to be the hostess with the mostess, I'm sure of it. <laughs> this, this brings back um, really good memories to me. Right. And I know but I remember hauling hay down in Sam's Valley when I was probably 13, 14 years old, and, and I think we were charging like eight cents a bale to do it, and I would get a penny of it, right? <laughs> 
and we could do those things then. And then, uh, right? Yeah, it, it wasn't a lot. I mean, it was a lot of money to me then, but it was really good work. And yeah, yeah my first job in, in hauling hay was moving the bales out from, and these were pretty big, and I was not that strong. Moving the bales out of the way of the truck, you know, I'd have to jump off the truck. And uh, it turned into, by the time I was 17, my, my friend uh, Dave Boyles, who actually, Sass Young, and he was a partner, we actually bought a hay hauling truck, a um, couple loaders, and uh, had our own business. That's very and cool. of course it's burned up right now, but I'll never forget being on a hill in Phoenix, down in Phoenix, Oregon. And he and I were really, you know, we'd had all this experience and we bid this hay hauling job. and. Um, we went up and picked up a couple of bales and realized, oh, this is just pea hay. It's really light, and it hadn't been baled really tight. So we bid it really cheap, and we thought we could get it done really fast. And I'll never forget, we just put a new bed on the truck. It was wood, and we're on this hillside. First of all, the, the, the bales were so loose, we could hardly get them up the loader, tighten it down, tighten it down. Finally, the first one, I'm on the back of the truck, first one hits the ground, and all these peas fly all over the uh, bed of the truck, and I'm slipping. Fallen. <laughs> we get down to the. We get. I don't know why I'm telling this story because this is a really good <laughs> yeah, program. It is a good for, program for youth, <laughs> because you'll never forget these experiences uh, when you're young and what it teaches you. So we get down and we're unloading the truck, and uh, I said, Dave, I don't know where my hook is. You know these hay these mm -hmm. hay hooks. He goes, Well, we got extras behind there, so we get the extras, and then on the way back up the hill, you hear this. Psh, 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 psh. We found the hook. In a tire. <laughs> we lost our shorts. It took us like 500 days. <laughs> well, good. I hope we I hope we get some kids that um, some farmers that apply for this and really get some youth that'll have some good experiences. Yep. And I they'll agree. be sitting here someday talking about those things. Agreed. I love it. Now we have a motion and a discussion. So any further discussion? Any further stories? <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 That's so cool. All right. Uh, first action item is under Health and Human Services, consider approval of a contract for services with Robert Wolf, MD, in the amount of 540000 to provide medical director services for behavioral health programs re retroactive June 1st, 2021 through May 31st, 2024. Sydney, good morning. It's good to see you. Uh, good morning, commissioners. I'm Sydney Nestor. I'm the Behavioral Health Division Director with Marion County Health and Human Services. Um, today before you, asking for approval of a contract with Dr. Rob Wolf. He's been working for Marion County Health and Human Services for, well, it's got to be at least a decade. I'm looking for a minute. Yeah, <laughs> for, for, a minute. for quite a long time. <laughs> and he provides uh, several really important services for us. He does some direct prescribing for ESA. So if you're aware of ESA, that's our Early Assessment Support and Alliance Program that serves young adults. I don't think I got that acronym right, but I said it so confidently and then realized that probably wasn't correct. But um, that serves our young adults who are having their first episode of a psychotic experience. So he still prescribes for our ESA team and consults and is considered an expert in that area and provides backup prescription support to ABH and PCC. Um, he's always available in a pinch. And additionally, um, he helps support the medical team, so our contracted prescribers in terms of their, you know, kind of processes, policies, um, overall functioning of the med team. So we kind of work those issues together and having an MD to provide support who can, you know, talk the prescriber's language is very, very helpful for me. <laughs> So um, anyway, uh, he continues to stick it out with us, which I really appreciate. And so we're asking for a three-year contract for Dr. Wolf. Okay. Any questions? No. Any questions? Do you want me to make a motion? No, no, no. It's my motion. Yeah, I just didn't is. know if okay. you had any. Nope. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the contract for services with Robert Wolf, MD, in the amount of $540,000 to provide medical director services for behavioral health programs retroactive from June 1st, 2021 through May 31st, 2024. I second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 
Okay, that passes. And Sydney, you're still up. Consider approval up. of contract for services with Nathal Kravitz LLC, Nathaniel Kravitz LLC, in the amount of two hundred seventy-three thousand to provide psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner services to individuals with mental health programs in the mental health programs through June thirtieth, twenty twenty-three. Yes, thank you. Uh, so Nate again has also been a prescriber with us as a psychiatric nurse practitioner for quite some time he uh, serves ABH our adult behavioral health program and also PSRB um, our psychiatric review board individuals is he's the pri primary prescriber for them he works up to 21 hours a week um, so asking for a contract for him for two years to continue the great work he does for us I do have a question about this. Is this contract or this individual somebody that could potentially, I assume that a bulk of his duties are um, over on Silverton Road or yes. other, maybe, okay. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, is there an opportunity for him to, to go to other sites? Let's say that there was a, an opportunity um, mm -hmm. in the Northeast Salem area to have his services provided on site a few days mm -hmm. a week. Is that something that could, this contract could be expanded to or an opportunity for discussion to occur? Or is his services very specific to Silverton Road? Um, the way that the contract is written is a little more general in terms of the um, type of work that he does, the populations served. We have, um, in addition to Rob, we have two psychiatrists and uh, four psychiatric for psychiatric nurse practitioners that work doing prescribing services for behavioral health, um, just well, the mental health side of behavioral health. And so certainly any of them would be <coughs> capable of doing that and their contracts don't, I mean, exclude their ability okay. to do that. Great, mm -hmm. thank you. Good mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just for clarification, the exhibit A, it says provide skilled medical assess assessment and supervision of individuals who use therapeutic medications. So it doesn't limit it to any location. Perfect. People on the program. Yeah, mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Any other questions? Nope. So we'll take a motion. Uh, Mr. Cherry moved to approve the contract for services for Nathaniel Kravitz LLC in the amount of $273,000 to provide psychi psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner services to individuals in mental health programs through June 30th, 2023. And I second the motion. Yeah, motion second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Great. So we've got, this is our mental health morning, isn't it? <laughs> <sighs> so our next item is to consider approval of contract for services with Salem Health in the amount of $500,000 to provide acute inpatient psychiatric services retroactive to January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2021. And Anne-Marie is here. Good morning, we haven't seen you in a while. It's been a little while. Good morning, yeah. Anne-Marie Banfield, Program Manager for Health and Human Services, the Acute and Forensic Behavioral Health Programs. Good morning. Um, this uh, contract is for Salem Health to provide our uh, psychiatric services for indigent persons at their psychiatric medicine center. Um, this is a great contract for us. We are, they do about 98% of our placements for psychiatric hospitalization. They're right across the street from our crisis center, so it's a great combination. We have a good partnership with them. It allows us to partner really closely with them for people coming out of the psych unit who maybe haven't had services, they haven't had access to benefits, they haven't had um, supports, and then we work very closely with them. Sometimes we'll actually go on the unit to engage them and get them uh, comfortable with us so that they will follow up with us. Um, I think they manage this contract really well with us in terms of anybody who's eligible for Oregon Health Plan, they will sign them up while they're on the unit. So it's a, it's a great contract, it's a good pro uh, partnership with Salem Hospital. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. Is are these dollars pass through dollars from Oregon Health Authority? Yes. Okay. And is it the reason this is delayed and retroactive to January because we just didn't get the funding from OHA in time? I'm looking at Ryan in the audience. I know that it, we were there were several issues with the contract, and so that we, it took some time for the contract to come through. Okay. Yeah, we just recently. That's right. Uh, yes. And you get center stage. <laughs> Uh, 
for the record, Ryan Matthews, Administrator for Marion County Health and Human Services. So, is that mic on? It is. I think so. Okay. Oh, sorry, am I too there far you. away? Sorry there about that. And so, yes, it, as you might recall, we just recently signed EIGA for the calendar year 2021. And so this is delayed because we, we had to execute our IGA, which had this funding as a component of it. And then now you'll start to see all the sort of pass through and subcontracts related to that coming through for approval. Just for the public's knowledge, IGA. Intergovernmental like Agreement. Store. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, that'd be a fun place to shop, wouldn't it? No, it's an intergovernmental agreement between uh, Oregon Health Authority and Marion County. So when you say there's issues with the contract, was it just trying to get that IGA in place? There was no like challenges between Marion County and Salem Health or the funding with OHA to make this execute? No, I mean, I definitely think there was some review of the contract language in, in the uh, agreement with Oregon Health Authority that we wanted to do, but also we didn't even receive the dra initial draft contract until several months into the year. So it took a long time for Oregon Health Authority to put the, put the contract together, uh, you know, figure out the allocations across counties. And then it took some time for us to do the thorough review to make sure that it, it was something that we felt comfortable signing. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes. Good. All right. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the contract for services with Salem Health in the amount of $500,000 to provide acute inpatient psychiatric services retroactive from January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2021. I second the motion. And the motion second. Any further discussion? I just Here. want yep. to say to Anne Marie and your team, thank you. What you do is invaluable to this community and to the individuals that you serve. And I think all at the moment when they're interacting with you, they might not recognize the care they're getting. But I, I don't think that there's a better organization in Marion County than your organization to serve people in the depths of crisis. And it's, I really admire and respect what you do. Thank you. I'll pass that on to the staff. I know they've had a rough year and they'll really appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I'll echo that, and, and our whole mental um, health care program that, that uh, you know, in Sydney, we just approved a couple uh, contracts there. We were doing, uh, and Ryan just did this um, analysis for us the other day that I shared with the <laughs> city of Salem about how many, uh, how many people we actually uh, engage with in our um, mental health and drug and alcohol um, addiction programs, and it's substantial. And, uh, obviously, it's substantial amount right here in the, in the city of Salem. So thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, and we all know that um, we probably even need more, right? I mean, it's just a, it's an area that sad that, that it's growing and growing and growing. And, and it doesn't seem like we can keep up with the, the demand and the need. But uh, for the resources that we have, I think we do a really, really good job. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. <clears throat> We're gonna go from our mental health to our information technology. And uh, Gary's here and Ryan. Consider approval of a contract for services with Intradu Inter Interactive Services Corporation in the amount of 150,000 to provide patient messaging services for the new electronic health record system through June 30th, 2026. Welcome. Good Morning. to see you. Gary Christofferson, uh, IT Director, IT Interim Director. Um, I'm here this morning to help uh, you guys understand what we're doing here with the health department. Um, IT and the health department are currently working together to replace the legacy health records management system, which is currently named Raintree with a very modern software suite that's called Dr. Cloud. Uh, we've been working together for what, two, two years now, I think, going through the RFP process, selecting this vendor. The project kicked off in September of last year. It's currently scheduled to be completed in June of 2022. Uh, we're in the final stages of what we call a map and gap process, where we work with the health department and the vendor to identify all the missing features or functionality that are required by the county to go live with the new system. It's a very normal part of the project management process where you identify little things here and there that were missed along the way. Uh, we're very close to having that final schedule and the final uh, plan. Uh, we're just really close to tidying everything up to where we know exactly the size and scope of this project. 
that includes identifying all the data migrations, all the reports, um, all the training, and all the required interfaces uh, for this application to communicate with the other pieces of software that are required to make this whole suite successful. Uh, the interface is simply a piece of software that allows different software suites to communicate with each other. And Trotto is one of 14 interfaces that are part of this project, and this is a new interface. Um, as IT, I don't know a lot about the specifics of what Intrado is, so I just kind of wanted to lead you up to where we are and what an interface is, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ryan so he can tell you exactly what Intrado does for the health department. Okay, and once again, for the record, Ryan Matthews, Administrator for the Health and Human Services Department. So, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about Intrado. This is a, a functionality that we have lacked for as, you, as uh, Gary mentioned, we have an old legacy system. We have an electronic health record that's been around for, I don't know, 17 years, something to that nature, and much of the functionality that's needed to really provide the, the kind of care that we expect to provide to, to people in our community is lacking. And this is one of the functions. And so what Intrado does is it's a patient, uh, patient messaging system. So when you think about your doctor appointments or dentist appointments, you usually get a text message or a reminder call or an email, whatever sort of methodology that you want to have that, that's just sort of commonplace in, in our industry and that's something that our current system does not have that functionality. So we see very high no-show rates, which I think in part can be attributed to the fact that we don't have an appointment reminder system. Uh, in anything that we do in that front is just manual staff needing to do outreach and reaching out and making those calls, which is, is not a great use of resources and time. So what Intrado will do is it will allow us to set up whichever methodology people choose so if they prefer email if they prefer a call if they prefer a text we can set that up in the system and our EHR uh, and soft tech which is dr. cloud EHR is the product we purchased is going to then build the interface so this is integrated within our electronic health record when we implement it so it'll give us the functionality we need to really provide better customer service and, and better support to the people that, that we serve and, and again, this functionality is something that is required by CMS, so uh, meaningful use standards around uh, electronic health records are outlined in federal statute, and this is an element that we currently lack, meaning that at some, at some point you can start to face penalties if you don't have a system that can fulfill all the, all the requirements. Uh, so, so we're really excited about it, and I think sometimes it's hard to also think about this huge electronic health record product that we purchase, and you sort of assume it can do everything, but I think if you kind of think of it almost like your cell phone, where the electronic health record is kind of your iPhone, and then occasionally you do have to download applications to get some of the functionality you need, if you need something to, to do, you know, driving directions and mapping, or, or whatever those, calendaring, whatever those functions are, and so this is one of the applications that we need to purchase, and then we pay our vendor to integrate that into the system so it's really seamless. Okay. Welcome to the 21st century. <laughs> we're, 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 we're getting there. <laughs> I'm like, this is so great. I, I assume the text message or whatever, I think it's a text that I get from my doctor. It's like, hey, are you going to make it? Yes or no? So yeah, it'll, be, it'll be, be something feasible. to that effect. Yeah, right. and, and if, if people would rather not get a text and rather get an a automated call, you know, they can, we can set that up. So it'll have all the different options. Fantastic. Yeah, it'll be great. Right behind the courts. Courts do it now, too. I wouldn't know that because I don't frequent any <laughs> need to have that I'm not contact. Gonna, I'm not going to yeah, 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 tell that story. That. Okay, that's probably best. <laughs> all right, anything else? All right, Mr. Chair, I move to approve the contract for services with Entrado Interactive Services Corporation in the amount of $150,000 to provide patient messaging, messaging services for the new electronic health record system through June 30, 2026. I'll second the motion. We have a motion and second. Any further discussion? I just, only $150,000 for that period of time. The contract is oh. for $20,000 a year for the yeah. service itself. Okay. And then I think every time the service is used, there's there's yeah, a small there's a fee. fee so it, it's it. it's a relatively inexpensive software suite, but when you sign a five-year contract, it adds up to over hundred thousand okay. dollars. So yeah, I agree. The the cost is not that significant. For right. So I think it's it's really good functionality for the price. For this portion, it's not that much, but the yeah. overall program is. I mean, the overall electronic health record. Right. It's yes. been it's, a it's, big it's investment. A, it's a large investment yes, for yes. us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something in that yearly mm -hmm. five year gap or whatever. Thank you. Yeah, okay. We have a motion. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 
I should have said we had a motion and a second. Gary, thank you for uh, stepping in and doing a great job. No um, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Uh, next item is under Public Works, approve an order appointing uh, Bobby Manuel, Malcolm Aquinas, and Chris Wow. Techro? Tycro. Tycro. Okay, I got close. To the Marion County Parks Commission with terms ending June 16th, 2025. Tom is here. And I think we have. Uh, All three here. Great, fantastic. I know, I know we had uh, five openings in our Parks Commission, correct? Correct, and hopefully after today we have two remaining openings, and we have, uh, I believe, three candidates for those two remaining openings. Fantastic. Yeah. Sherry's doing a good job recruitment. Yes, she is. Good. Uh, for the record, Tom Kissinger, Public Works. Uh, we're here today to, dis to discuss the appointment of Bob Emanuel, Malcolm Aquinas, and Chris Tycro to the Marion County Parks Commission with terms beginning today and ending June 16th, 2025. Uh, just a reminder, the Marion County Board of Commissioners formed the Marion County Parks Commission by board order on September 16th, 1958. It consists of a minimum of seven to a maximum of 11 voting members. And as I mentioned, um, we have five open positions currently, but after today, we will have two remaining open positions. Uh, all three applicants were interviewed by Public Works staff and the chair of the Parks Commission on June 2nd, 2021, and the unanimous, unanimous consensus was to recommend all three candidates for appointment. Uh, all three applicants live or work in the Salem area. They enjoy the outdoors and desire to make a significant con contribution to the rebuilding, longevity, and accessibility of Marion County Parks. And with that, I'll turn it over to our three applicants if you have any questions. Okay, who wants, who wants to go first and just tell us a little bit about your background and why you want to do this? Sure. Um, I'm Chris Tycro. Um, my background is primarily in the lumber and housing industry uh, for the past 26 years. I've worked for a lumberman's and a small independent up on Whidbey Island. Um, I'm an avid outdoorsman. I uh, love kayaking, hiking, all the above. Um, in fact, I was actually kind of looking for some new hiking trails here in Marion County when the application popped up and I saw it. So um, I currently am a realtor for Berkshire Hathaway uh, Real Estate Professionals, and uh, part of my goal in my career is to give back to the community and I just happened to find something that I had a passion with so I thought it was a great fit. Great. We're gonna need some new trails. Yes we are. <laughs> There's a lot of them that are closed. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And who wants to go next? Good morning. I'm Bob Emanuel. Um, as you mentioned, your daughter's is the first day of work experience. Well, this is my first time before this commission, so be gentle. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> um, I'm retired. I've worked uh, for John Deere Company in the agricultural business uh, for 39 years. Um, been working mostly in various volunteer efforts uh, locally. Uh, when the application came up for the Parks Commission, all of a sudden I realized that there's a lot of things I've been enjoying in the parks area, but I've not really ever given back in a sense. And looking forward, I think there's opportunities now for development for, for future folks to enjoy long term. So um, looking to enjoy it. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for giving back. Appreciate it and welcome. Would There's a first time for all of us to be here. <laughs> That's right. Right. Just before we move on, do you have three amazing kids named Aaron, Luke, and Ben? Yes, I do. <laughs> so when you first moved here in seventh grade, Aaron was my first best friend in middle school. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I spent a lot of time at your house. She's currently a fifth grade so, teacher. I know. She was at Sweepel for a long time. I don't know if she's still there, but yeah, we graduated high school together. Okay. So anyway, I'm really glad you're doing this. All right, thank you. Good to know. I'll pass that along to her. Yeah. Go ahead and move that microphone over. Yeah, I'll share that microphone. Malcolm. Uh, my name is Malcolm Aquinas. Uh, I currently work at the Oregon State Hospital. Um, I also love the outdoors. Um, I had the privilege of working uh, for the U.S. Forest Service as a wilderness ranger, and. I love recreating out with uh, my family and friends, and I'm excited for the opportunity to uh, work with the Marion County uh, Parks Department to expand and grow uh, my I have a particular interest in increasing access uh, for marginalized communities um, so that they're more aware and it feels more receptive and welcoming. 
Fantastic. Wow. All, all three of you have great backgrounds and experiences. I was just going to say that um, I think it's Oregon Department of Forestry right now is looking to bring on a fair amount of hands and labor to um, go up well into the woods restoration. to do restoration of the trails uh, create new trails and clear the trails that were impacted so I'm I'm sure that in some way Tom ha has all the information on that but what a great opportunity to partner with specifically the Sanium Canyon um, a lot of our trails aren't open yet and I'm I'm hoping that very soon we'll see some teams up there and I will join you because I want them yeah. open as well yeah, definitely mm -hmm. we all do yeah. Tom, have you uh, shared the vision of the <coughs> County Park Restoration Long-Term Plan with these individuals? Have they seen that? Yes, we have. So uh, they actually joined us for the Parks Commission meeting where we presented that information. Um, so they've seen the, all the concept maps and all the um, information that we provided to the board. Um, so we're all very excited about that. And, you know, kind of one of the things that we talked about in the interviews was the idea of you know, I can sit here and dream all day of what these parks are, but they're not my parks, they're the public's parks. Mm -hmm. And that's what the purpose of this commission is, is to provide that public input and to help guide us in that. And um, we're very excited to bring on this new group of applicants and uh, parks commission members to help us, you know, guide parks into the future. I, I just couldn't think of a more important time when you joined our parks commission uh, with the destruction of what five six 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 parks technically seven seven parks uh, in the wildfires and I, I drive up the canyon I live in Detroit and I drive up the canyon and ever since the fire I can now see that trail yep it goes all the way from gates all the way almost up to the dam uh, yep. you know and I, I see that old railroad trail and I just I, I, I'm getting chills just thinking about it can you imagine having that trail as a place people could walk and bike all the way up the canyon and enjoy that. Um, you know, through this destruction, there's always new beautiful things that come back up. And I, when you guys presented that vision, I went, oh, I didn't even know that. Now I see yep. it every day when I go up there. Couldn't see it before. Right, now you can see it. Um, and I do the same thing every time I drive by, I, I watch it and I, track where it goes and everything. Uh, I believe if you started Minto and went up to Niagara, it'd be about 15 miles. Um, wow. So you can it, it, stop at each one of our parks along the way. And yeah, have and there's, and there's, some can't, there's some gullies that you'd have to build bridges across. Correct. But I, I, I kind of want to take that trip someday with you or with, with some of the park commissions, put our boots on and start. I think we should do a field trip. And just, I agree. Yeah, and, and just <laughs> uh, hike it right now in the raw, you yep. know, and just get a, a feel for it so we could, uh, you know, actually watch it if it comes together. Yeah. Just thank you for serving. Um, and uh, I'd like to hear more about, have you done, you know, you talked about hikes you've done or the Pacific Coast Trail or have you done Sisters, you know, all that, that stuff is really exciting to me, even though I won't do it. <laughs> I, love, I love the outdoors. So. Will this group participate in the Auburn, the suggested Auburn Area Park Correct. process? Correct, yes. Great. Yep. So that's kind of our next thing that we're bringing to you um, that will also be shared at our next Parks Commission meeting, the results of that survey. Great. Okay. So we need a motion. I think it's my turn. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve an order appointing Bob Emanuel, Malcolm Aquinas, and Chris Tykro to the Marion County Parks Commission with terms ending June 16th, 2025. I second the motion. All right, we have a motion second. Any further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Congratulations and welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Tom, thanks for all your work, too. Thank you. All right. Item number six, consider adopting, under public works, consider a, uh, adopting administrative ordinance amending the Marion County Comprehensive Plan urbanization element. Brandon. Hi, good morning. Boy, it's been silence from you for a while. We were seeing you every day. I know. Every week. Sorry. Welcome Sorry back. about that. <laughs> He's been busy. You yeah. never He's know. Still lots going on. <laughs> um, thank you, Commissioners. Good morning. For the record, Brandon Reich, Building and Planning Division Manager of Public Works. The Marion County Comprehensive Plan is comprised of various elements. One of those elements is the urbanization element which provides policies and guidance about how urban growth boundaries are established and how land is managed in the county while it's inside the UGB before it's annexed into the city. It also contains a section called the Growth Management Framework. 
The language in the framework currently does not contain the requirements that must be complied with. The framework was not updated to reflect the new processes available to cities in reviewing their land use. Cities must comply with state requirements demonstrating the consistency with county guidelines is optional. So based on that, on April 14th this year, the board adopted an order initiating consideration of amendments to the Marion County Conference of Plan urbanization elements. On May 26, 2021, the board held a hearing to consider the amendments. After the close of the hearing, the board approved the amendments and directed staff to return with an ordinance reflecting its decision. The ordinance was scheduled for adoption last week and it's today before the board to be considered for adoption. With that, I'm available for any questions you may have. Any questions? No questions? No questions. All right. All right, Mr. Chair, I move to approve, excuse me, I move to adopt an administrative ordinance amending the Marion County Comprehensive Plan urbanization element. I second the motion. Motion second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thanks, Brandon. All right. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Okay, our next item is under the Sheriff's Office. Consider approval of amendment number one to incoming funds, intergovernmental agreement with the East Salem Service District add $4,943,139 for a new contract total of $9,886,278 to update the language and extent, extend the term to June 30th, 2024 for law enforcement services. And Commander, you're here. I don't see the Sheriff, but I see you. Yeah, unfortunately he couldn't make it. Good morning, uh, I'm Jeff Stoutrude with the uh, Sheriff's Office, the Patrol Commander. Here today, as the Commissioner just read, um, to talk about amendment for the IGA for the East Salem Service District. Uh, the amendment would extend it for three additional years out to June 30th of 2024. Uh, it also uh, adds some language in about some uh, insurance premiums and adjustments there. Um, as you know, the, uh, this IGA basically it provides 10 additional deputies to um, conduct law enforcement services in the East Salem Service District, which is Northeast Salem, Hayesville, and uh, the Four Corners area. Um, these, these 10 deputies are in addition to the already uh, deputies that are, have been working in these areas as well as throughout the entire county. Um, so it's not moving deputies out, it's supplementing the deputies that we already have there. Um, historically, the calls for service within the ESSD have been about 54, 53% of the total calls for service within Marion County. Um, last year, that number actually went up, the percentage went up to about 60% of the total calls in Marion County, uh, and partially in due to um, their increased presence and activities being out in the community. Um, the, other, the other piece to this is, and I'm super excited about getting the bike program, I think I talked about this previously, uh, but training to get the deputies out uh, through the bike training is coming up in the next several weeks. We have the bikes, we're working on some bike shorts and pants and some uniform items to get them out. This is, it's exciting, especially going into the summer, it's a perfect time to do it. It'll get them into areas, you know, it gets them out of their patrol cars, having personal contact with the community, just working on those relationships and, and making contact with the community members out there. Um, and, and I'll end with a couple people that I would be remiss if I didn't mention them up here talking about the East Salem Service District. One of them is sitting in the back of the room, as most of you know, Glenn Rader. He's on the board of the SSD, but also he's a very active member. Um, I would say Glenn is, is probably a, an accountability partner for us as the Sheriff's Office as we continue on with this service district uh, and this partnership. You know, Glenn, Glenn asked the questions. He has a lot of the historical pieces um, and he's not afraid to ask the questions. Call us when we're missing the boat on stuff. And thank you, Glenn, I appreciate that. The other person is uh, Nicole Tarter. Um, she is uh, a community member that organizes and runs probably one of the biggest neighborhood group meetings, ongoing meetings up in the Hayesville area. And so she's been a huge supporter of ours as well. So have to say thank you to Glenn and thank you to Nicole. And obviously thank you to the board for for uh, pushing this through for us. Yeah, I see Glenn here. Does Glenn want to uh, come up and say anything? Uh, 
Okay. He's doing a great job. All right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to echo your uh, comments about Glenn. And uh, when I first met him was in, at the advisory, the Sheriff's Advisory Committee over, we were at the jail, I remember. Um, and then through the whole, I think it was two year process that uh, Sheriff Myers and I went out and had town hall meetings. Glenn was at all of those meetings yep. and was one of the most vocal supporters of uh, establishing the service district. And um, it's, it's not often that <clears throat> I think we make a decision to um, call a tax, a fee or whatever. Uh, and have um, citizens support that because I think they really see exactly what they're getting for those dollars. And uh, this has been a really, it's, it's been a slow start, but it's been a really good program. I love hearing about the bikes. I can see, I, I'm not gonna speak for her, but maybe I need to do a ride along on that one. I was I'm, still, I'm waiting for my turn. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can set that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the bikes would be going through the neighborhoods or going uh, into the business district or? Both. Okay. Both, right. yep. Yeah, you know, I see the Salem guys downtown because I have an apartment down there. And so that's what kind of the model we're going to do is, is wandering around. Is it going to be two bikes, three bikes, four we, bikes? We have three bikes right now. Okay. Uh, we'd like to build that up a little bit more to, to four or five even just so that you know, when there's events, say National Night Out, we can get the entire team out there on bikes doing, or at least half the team, doing doing patrols. You know, the, the big piece of that is just that personal connection with the community. Sure. You know, if people are out doing yard work, they can just stop by on the sidewalk and, and have those conversations. And, you know, the other part from the, the crime prevention side of it, not a lot of people expect cops to be riding up on bicycles and they can get into smaller, you know, little walk paths in between residential areas and stuff. So it, it will be very, very good on two, two hands. Okay. I just I can't imagine in my mind what this looks like. I mean, we're not Portland, right? And the station where they kind of check in and check out is kind of a bit of a distance from like their coverage area. So can you just paint a picture for me as to how, are they gonna like put a bike rack on the back of their rigs and park on a corner or what? Yeah, we'll have, we'll have bike racks for the vehicles. Um, and actually we have two substations. One of them is in Chemeketa Community College okay. where the deputies can work out of. They'll probably park the cars there and then ride into the, the north area from there. Um, and then down in the Four Corners area, uh, the church on State Street in about the 4400 block, there's a substation there that we're using as well. Okay. So those would kind of be probably the hubs for parking the cars and then riding out from there. Um, but yeah, they won't be riding from, from the new PSV building. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they do. I want to follow behind and watch. So my second question is, <coughs> is there going to be patrol cars while there's officers on bikes in the ESSD working in tandem? Absolutely, yep. Because if they make an arrest or, or need cover or something, they need the cars to supplement and get there a little bit quicker than folks on a bike. If I was on a bike, it would take me a while to get there. But I will tell you, one of the bikes we got is a, it's an electric assist. It's, it's pretty amazing. Okay. Oh, yeah. I am you, doing a ride along Mr. Kieran was just that. saying, we should get some electric assists out yeah. there. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I just turned to Commissioner Willis and said we need electric assist bikes. I've done that, and I love that. I, mean, I think I went 35 miles, and, and I was pumping, but the person that was with me, did, they used a lot more electricity than or battery than I right. did. But, uh, now the story it, comes out because I heard he went on a 35-mile bike ride, and I was shocked. But now I know that there was a battery involved, so that makes much more well, sense. Well, it was flat. It was, it was, it still it was, was 35 miles. It still was 35 miles. 35 miles. Yeah. When I was a kid, I used to do it on a heavy schwinn, right? You know, another story for another day. <laughs> well, I just I want to echo what you had to say about Glenn and about the East Salem, I don't know what we're calling it, the advisory board uh, or body. Um, I just think it's a super uh, healthy and competent uh, advisory body. Uh, there, there have been a number of times where Glenn will just be in a meeting and be like, hey, what are you guys doing? Like, there's a problem here and you guys have to fix it. And you're, you're missing the boat. And he says it from a, from a place of support. Like, I support what you guys are doing. This is, and I, I think sometimes we talk about this, you know, our attitude is we're good and we're going to be better. You know, and I, and I think this body really does a, a really good job of embodying that spirit where they're not afraid to speak up. They're not afraid to have positive and constructive criticism. They're not afraid to say, hey, you guys need to do X and you're doing Y. Um, but it comes from a place of we support you. We're glad you're doing the work that you're doing and we're grateful for it. And sometimes in government, you can have 
this, these sort of dysfunctional conversations where it's sort of like finger pointing or you're a bad guy or whatever and, and the community isn't able to, to make progress because you're just stuck in the fighting. And, and so I just, I just want to thank Glenn and, and thank all the members of that advisory body because I feel like it's a very constructive, competent group that's really helped us um, do our work. So. Yeah, absolutely. And it's an important piece because we don't always get it right and there's things that we don't recognize that we need pointed out to us and we want to know those. We want yeah. to know where our shortfallings are and, and so we can make them better and that's exactly what they do. So that's a yeah. great point. All right. Whose turn is it? My turn? Yes. yes okay. Yes. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve Amendment Number 1 to the Incoming Funds Intragovernmental Agreement with the East Salem Service District to add $4,943,139 for a new contract total of $9,886,278 to update the language and extend the term date to June 30th, 2024 for law enforcement services. I second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Um, do we want to amend that to add a couple more electric assist bikes so that the commissioners can go on right along? All right. One specifically for the commissioner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, uh, <laughs> any further? Yeah. 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 Let's just do three. I think we should just publicly yeah. notice the meeting and make us all go. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Any further discussion? I do actually have one question. Yeah. Um, it says incoming funds. Where's the money? Where's the incoming funds from? Uh, well, people are whispering behind the microphone, so anybody can answer it. Well, I, I believe they're coming from the assessments that come from the service sure. district. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think it's, I mean, I have a general idea of it, but I think the public doesn't really understand where these dollars are coming from, and ultimately it's coming from taxpayers, correct? Correct, yes. Through, through their in, tax processing bills and to support them directly. Yeah, in the service district, right. it's, uh, it's $10 a month, $120 a year per um, house. Uh, I think per apartment, yeah, and then, and then um, commercial. There's some rate per acre. 120 for the for that for this program. So that okay. comes in, and then so it's coming from them directly. I guess my yeah. point to ask that is is that it's important that for me to have the, the public understand that this is a service they're directly paying for, and it directly benefits them. It's not another organization. Although everything in government is taxpayer funded, this is a very specific stream of dollars that comes from that specific community to, sub to return the support to them. So. And that's a great point. I didn't mention this, but the 10 deputies that are funded under this IGA specifically work within the boundaries of the East Salem Service District. So they're not up in Detroit. They're not up in St. Paul. They're, they're specifically responding to calls and providing those service within the boundaries of those districts. Thank you. Yep. And we still have our other deputies that will respond inside the service district. And, and we've heard the commander say this before. If there was an emergency call outside the service district, you know, a, a shooting or wherever, these guys are moving, right? I right. Mean, but, but generally, they're, they're right there. It's just the same as, as the communities that we contract with, Jefferson or, or Sublimity. Right. Correct. If there's an incident, it's not like we're going to be like, oh, well, you only contract for one deputy. I guess that's all you get, <laughs> right? right? It's, if there's an incident, you know, we bring the resources, but but it's nice, I think, for these communities having dedicated community right, police, so so that there's somebody there regularly that they can get to know and can respond. Yeah, yeah. I like to look at it as is the you know the the Four Corners community and the Hayesville that we have five deputies assigned to each of those areas. That really we want to make those deputies those neighborhood police officers. You know, they're connected. Every one of the community members have their cell phone numbers, they can reach out directly to them. It's really getting to know the community and being involved in that community. I think it's an excellent model of what community policing is supposed to be. I really appreciate that you're so steadfast in the commitment to it. It's yeah. really important. Yep. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. Uh, hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Before he runs off, can I just say really quick on the record that today's Wednesday. So Monday, um, midday, I took a call um, from a gentleman that owns a pretty large property in Brooks. Mm -hmm. And I contacted the sheriff, and I understand you guys had a meeting at 3 o'clock. And at 5 o'clock, I heard back from that member, well done. <laughs> Thank you. Seriously. Yeah. Um, so for, for those of you that don't know about this, 
if you drive along Brook Lake on the east side of I-5 in front of the former NORPAC, which is now Oregon Potato, it's turned into a full-on homeless camp with RVs and abandoned vehicles, and it's, it's an extreme hazardous area. And on Sunday night, there was an interaction um, between some staff at Oregon Potato and the individuals that, were, that are, frankly, trespassing. And um, there's been a lot of agency challenge from the state on this, and the commander and the sheriff engaged immediately and have already created a plan um, with Lieutenant Zahner from OSP and are, are taking ownership and working towards a, an active solution. And that, that, that commercial property resident was uh, shocked, I think. Uh, so, I mean, his hair was on fire when I talked to him the first time. And then the second time, he was, he was really just shocked that not only did he get a direct call from somebody um, at your level, but that there was a plan already in place. So I just can't say enough how great Marion County Sheriff's Office is and the fact that you guys actually really do your job. You respond quickly. It really matters. And, and you, th you thoughtfully think ahead because you don't want to be doing this repeatedly and wasting resources. So yeah. just really good job. Thanks for making my job so much easier. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. He doesn't need to stay there, but um, <clears throat> uh, yesterday, um, having to get to cell service in enough time to be on our yeah. was it one thirty or two thirty two one thirty call, I was doing <laughs> mm, I don't know. Did you have an MCSO escort in the fort <laughs> in the forty right up yeah. the canyon? And here was uh, the green um, Nikoloff was he found a spot right in the pat right. Right by the passing lane where everybody, right I think it's right there by um, like, like Sweden, uh, little Sweden, right in yep, there. He had found a place is. where he could pull off because I remember talking to these guys and they said it's really hard to find places up there in that 40 mile an hour zone. But he wasn't touching guys that were going 52. I think he was looking for somebody that was going like 80 through there or something. But they were up in the canyon. There was two or two or three of our guys up in the canyon yesterday in the afternoon in the 40 mile an hour zone. So thanks. I thought for sure you were going to say you pulled over and did your meeting next to him. <laughs> I should have, but yeah, it was Nick, it was Nikoloff. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was up there. That's cool. And we're, you know, like people want to work for the sheriff's office, and I get it. Like it's a, I it's a I cool place, the and there's a good culture, and like you know. We're doing a few things, right? Yeah. yeah. That's right. All right. Thank thanks. You. And here's another one. All right, so we are here for our next item under the sheriff's office: consider approval of memorandum of understanding with the Marion County Health and Human Services Department in the amount of $477,814 to assess, monitor, and provide treatment services to Student Opportunity for Achieving Results, or we know it as our SOAR program, participants with substance abuse disorders through June 30th, 2023. Commander, good, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. For the record, Commander Kevin Carvondi, Sheriff's Office Community Corrections Division. And we are requesting the board approval of an MOU between the Sheriff's Office and Marion County Health and Human Services Department to provide substance abuse treatment services to SOAR participants. Just for a little bit of background, uh, SOAR is our, the definition of our flagship prison reentry program on our Chemeketa Community College campus. Uh, SOAR is an intensive and collaborative 12-week treatment, mentoring, and employment reentry uh, program designed for medium to high risk males with substance abuse issues with high criminogenic needs. The program helps reduce future criminal behavior by providing enhanced supervision, alcohol and drug mentoring, employment services, and substance abuse treatment. Uh, this particular MOU funds one certified alcohol and drug counselor and one certified mentor. And the two that are currently assigned to the program are, are just amazing. Uh, we're fortunate to have them on our team. Uh, the strength about this particular program uh, the collaborative nature of this uh, this model located on the Chemeketa campus. We truly have an excellent partnership with between the Sheriff's Office, Health and Human Services, and, and Chemeketa Community College. Uh, most importantly, we have amazing staff who are highly educated in best practices and have a passion to help and desire to have a positive impact on our clients' lives. Uh, as far as, and I always have to touch on some of the program successes, uh, you know, our, and, and, to be clear, our staff deserve all the credit. Uh, SOAR was implemented originally in January of 2010. We pushed through 37 individual 90-day cohorts. Over 700 clients have moved through the program, close to 60%, I think it's 58% uh, graduation rate. And our latest recidivism results continue to see a, we continue to see a decline in uh, all metrics, whether you're looking at the old definition, the new definition, uh, 
whether it's a new arrest, new conviction, new prison incarceration, on all metrics, if you compare program graduates to like population on supervision, they blow them out of the water and they're doing a phenomenal job. Uh, but again, these positive outcomes are a direct result of the hard work of our program staff um, and ultimately helping change the lives of our clients and couldn't be more proud to a, talk about it, um, proud of the program and, and, and just as if not more proud of our, our staff for all the hard work they do. With that, I'm available for any questions. I just really support this program. I'm, I'm passionately supportive of it. Um, and, and I think just more broadly, I'm supportive. We talked about the sheriff's office and what they do to keep us safe and um, stopping crime from happening and preventing people from committing crimes and holding people accountable when they commit crimes. I think the other side of the coin is, and this is something I know you, Commissioner Cameron, and a lot of local business owners and key members have actually participated in, and nonprofits, is helping people after they come out of prison to not commit crimes again, to, to get jobs, get housing. Um, and, and you know, I, I didn't necessarily know this 10 years ago or, or 15 years ago, but now I, I, you know, know more about some of my neighbors and friends. I'm like, oh, these are all people that were involved in the criminal justice system at some point in their lives. And these are people now I go to their stores and I eat at their restaurants and, mm -hmm. and I'm friends with them. And, and many of them are actually working with us to help other folks that are coming out of prison or in the criminal justice system. And so there's really this virtuous cycle where the work that you guys have done over the last decade or two um, to really help people who, who have committed crimes, who've been convicted, who've served their time and are coming out to, to help them see a different life for themselves, to help them achieve that different life, to help them overcome addictions if they have that. I'm now at the place where I sort of, you know, entered this space two and a half years ago, and I'm seeing kind of the benefits of that work. But I also understand that that work is, you know, 20, 20 hard years in the making, or even longer in some cases, you know? And so um, I just think that's really cool, and it's something that we don't talk about a lot, but it's having a, a really profound impact on our community. Absolutely, no, I agree. No, it's, it's, um the SOAR program. Have you been in the graduation? The SOAR? No. Okay. Oh. Not yet. What, how many cohorts are we done? So 37, and technically uh, graduation is tomorrow, but it's, uh, and I, I believe uh, someone from your office, is it Matt, reached out from your office, and I, I kind of want to give you the red carpet, of, <laughs> not the Zoom version of this half hour, because it is, we had to break up the cohorts and right. split in the morning right. and the afternoon, and it just doesn't do, it do the justice, because when you attend graduation, and I know uh, Commissioner Cameron, you, uh, you, you've spoken as a, as a keynote yeah. numerous times, and it is something else in the, the auditorium at Chemeketa. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a production, and that's the piece with this. Um, the pandemic has really trimmed some things down, but nonetheless, still push forward and, 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 and moving forward with the with the classes. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to get back to normal, and really honor them on graduation day. But before that, uh, we can do a have a show and tell and a quick tour at uh, at Chemeketa just to kind of see what we're doing. But it's pretty neat. Just to see them go through this, and you sat through the graduations. I mean, if you don't get a lump in your throat when you're listening to them talk, it's something's not right. I mean, you, you, the definition of changing lives when you when you hear them speak, and, and this is just 90 days, and it's not it's not over. We continue that through supervision, but it gives them a good start, uh, a good healthy foundation moving forward. Because what we've learned over the years is it's just um, old school way of doing business is release them from prison and off you go to. We need to be the definition of helpful as possible to get them on the right track. And some of them, it's extreme hand-holding. And some are, others, they just need some guidance and some mentoring and so on. But wrapping services around these folks as quickly as possible on the front end is the ticket. And that's what we've learned. Um, and then continuing that through supervision as well. And, and this is a high-risk uh, recidivism population. And would you say the recidivism rate we... So, yeah, just in case I was going yeah, right now, and so what we're doing is we're comparing it to, you know, graduates to like, I mean, apples to apples. Right. Uh, the latest recidivism rates, and, and this is so, 37 cohorts. I think we have, and everything is three years behind in in, uh, in right. data. So I'm I'm guessing this is probably we have 31, maybe 32 cohorts, uh, including the data. 30 percent less likely to be arrested. 12 percent less likely to be convicted of a misdemeanor or felony. 16% less likely to be convicted of a felony. That's the old definition of recidivism. Uh, we still track. And then 9% less likely 
uh, for it to be uh, a new incarceration in, in prison. And that's, and this is like, this is since 2010 of data, that's what's, it's the strongest co uh, model that we can look at saying, hey, this is, we're doing something right. But it is a combination of throwing the resources, having well-trained staff and best practices. And it's not just talking to our clients, it's educating them, it's teaching them skills. It's the fun role play, you know? Um, and it's that cognitive behavioral therapy model that we employ with regards to the substance abuse component but also too with the, uh, the employment component. We, we nicely borrowed the curriculum from the University of Cincinnati who are really the EBP, evidence-based practice gurus of working with the corrections population. And that's, that's helped us, I mean, tremendously. It's the curriculum. Um, in combination with awesome staff, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good system. Mr. Chair, one of the things that I think is so profound about this and talking to some of the graduates who have come out and are now five, 10, 15 years I guess it hasn't been around that long, but five years out or six years out. I think for folks who are in the criminal justice system, a lot of times their interaction with the government or law enforcement is pretty negative mm -hmm. because they may be engaging in behavior that's harmful to other people in the community, and we task the police to stop them, and, we, and the police often have to use force to stop them, right? So I think I've, in conversations I've had, some of the, like, it's almost like surprise that the government wants to help them or, you know, and there's, and there, there's this like period of like disbelief, right? Like, yeah, sure, you want to help us. Like, you're the people that have been chasing us down and, you know, we have this antagonistic relationship. But now there's been enough people that have been through this program that there's a certain amount of credibility where it's like, no, these people actually aren't our enemies. They actually want us to succeed. Um, and I think that sort of culture and that ethos has, has real credibility among people who are in the criminal justice system even today, that there, there are good people that, that work for Marion County, that work for the sheriff's office, that really do want us to succeed, which, you know, that's, that's hard to create that in the environment that, that you're in. Yeah, absolutely. Now you're spot on, though, with the connection and the rapport building. There's a high correlation of, you know, do you have a, a good rapport with your PO or not? And if you don't, the odds of them recidivating and taking off and going on scone status is extremely high. And so we've uh, t spoken about um, EPIC's effective practices and community supervision, the model of supervision that we apply. So we have all of our prison reentry and diversion programs, but also, I mean, the mothership is supervision, and it's our POs, and it's our POs working with our clients. And them implementing the cognitive behavioral approach of, of EPIC's, where it's a structured office interview, where they're le legitimately, they're, they're teaching them skills, they're role playing, they're issuing homework, and then repeat. And it's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's called, I mean, well, I remember when we were implementing, I mean, we, we trained our staff and implemented back in, and it was never implemented, it was implementing for a period of years because it's a process, but in 2011, it's taken you know, years to, to reach proficiency and still learning and still trying to get better, but it is, it's that, when you start talking to them about why they're here to begin with um, and helping them change the way they think so they ultimately make better decisions, you connect with the individual and you're showing that you actually care and you're trying to connect with them, build rapport, um, I think for us as a team and us as an office or a division, that was a, a big moment for us. It really was. And, uh, and it's not just ham hey, doing these things, it's, it's a culture. And they can feel it, especially when you look at the surveys from our clients, what we do once a year, and it just reaffirms we're on the right track. And what's funny is it actually keeps us as a community safer. Uh, absolutely. Because a lot of those folks who come out and are successful they call the police when there's problems. If there's something going on in the neighborhood, some of my neighbors, like, I know that they're gonna help keep, keep me safe, right? So it's like one of these really cool things where instead of having people that have been involved in the criminal justice system that you're afraid of, these are people that are now, help, they help keep, keep the community safe, which is, which is uh, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, and blessed to have great staff all the way around, mm -hmm. uh, sworn, non-sworn, we're, we're very fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, and Shemekka has been a great partner, starting with uh, President Roberts, uh, who, who said, open up the campus. You think about coming out of prison, and I'm sitting in a college campus now, right? I mean, there's all of these things that change somebody's attitude towards not only law enforcement, but just the support and the help they're getting. And, and the support we're getting continued from President Howard on the program is, is important that Shemekka is, is helping us with that. And then the stories, you know, you're talking about stories of, of uh, but not only keeping us safe, but uh, breaking the cycle of people, you know, who have gotten their children back together, mm -hmm. their families back together, and, and now have legitimate jobs and are, are giving back to the community. So 
This is this has been a great program. I don't know, um, you know, it was kind of unique to Marion County, and I don't know if anybody else has started it, but uh, we're still going at it. So, Kevin, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. I, I think uh, just to summarize basically everything that was said here today, of what I'm hearing is the community actually sees these humans for the humanity that they exist in. And that's the key to, to success and rehabilitation, in my opinion. It's, they're not defined by the mistakes that they made. They're defined by the opportunities that they can achieve. And I think that Marion County is extremely stellar in the fact that not only do we invest in these programs, we have people like you and your team, and I know members of your team that work in this program that are community members that I didn't know until recently, their, their previous life experience, because frankly, it doesn't matter to me. And I think it doesn't really matter to a bulk of the community. We just want to be healthy and safe and happy in our spaces. And I think Marion County just goes above and beyond with these programs to make sure that these folks understand um, that we want them to be healthy, happy, successful individuals in our community. And I think that that's profound. And I think that's outside the norm. And I'm proud of you and your team and the people that came before me for investing in this. And I can only see great opportunity and growth ahead. Um, you know, I understand what it's like. I've seen people come out. I have an uncle that went to prison. And when he came out, I got to watch him fumble through in Marion County the challenges. And I was, a, I was a young kid, but he didn't know what to do. It was like he was a refugee in his hometown. I, I can't imagine what it would be like to be plucked out of my community and incarcerated for a very long period of time. And then just like you said, released on the street. Good luck. Right. That's insane. Yeah. It's insane. And I'm glad that we don't do that. And I'm, I'll do whatever it takes to help these folks get back into a successful life, or whatever that means for them, because it's important to my family and to my community um, to do that. So I look forward to learning more and participating and helping it grow. Excellent. No, thank you. I appreciate the, the support. We couldn't do it without uh, with the, without each of your support. So, boy, I could talk all day about this. this the the, the uh, reentry uh, thing we did around the state. Uh, with the reentry council, we kicked it off here. The governor came and spoke. But one of the best exercises is this is this reentry simulation, and this was at the convention center. And there was probably at that one, Kevin, you were there. There was probably what 150 people or 200 people. I know we had 200 people in attendance. We go into this room, and all of a sudden, you're you're you get these deck of cards and stuff, and you're trying to figure out how to yeah. maneuver. And you, you come to me and I'm at the bus pass place. Well, you, before you can get a bus pass, you have to do this and you have to do this. And these people are just going around. <laughs> and at the end of that simulation, they realize you go back and you say, how hard is it that we've created this system even uh, to help people, you know, come out? So um, I don't know where we're going to go with that reentry council. We just had our first um, statewide uh, meeting last week with, you know, the governor. The, the, the governor never comes, but with with the uh, DOC and and uh, so it, hopefully we'll get that back on track and do some more things here in, in the county. It's funny COVID's because COVID's over because I feel like a lot of and you do a really good job kind of as an ambassador to other places, but I feel like a lot of times the state will be like, hey, we really have to fix community corrections and they, we have these really good ideas and then we get them and we're like, well, we we started those like 15 years ago, yeah. right? And it's really there's there's other places that aren't really doing this, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so I feel like, and this isn't just in corrections, there's a lot of areas where Marion County really ha has um, paved the way, and then we're asked to participate in these uh, statewide things, and they come back and tell us to do what we've already been doing for, for a little while. Yeah, right. So it's very, very uh, reinforcing that, that we're on the right track. Agreed. Not without our challenges, but we're doing good. <clears throat> All right. Okay, Mr. Chair, I move to approve the Memorandum of Understanding with the Marion County Health and Human Services Department in the amount of $477,814 to assess, monitor, and provide treatment services to student opportunity for achieving results SOAR participants with substance abuse disorders through June 30th, 2023. I second the motion. Motion is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Commander, thank you. Thanks for your service. Yeah, thank you. And your team. Yes. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Willis, do you want to read the calendar? I would love to. Okay. Uh, today is Wednesday, June 16th. It is uh, 
10:14, and we're just finishing up our board session here in the center hearing room. It's the first floor of 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. This afternoon at 4 o'clock, we have a FEMA briefing for local officials located in the commissioner's boardroom. That's the fifth floor of this building, 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. Uh, tomorrow, Thursday, June 17th at 8 in the morning, we have a Salem Marion County meeting located at the Sassy Onion. That's 1244 State Street in Salem. Thursday, uh, June 17th at 1 in the afternoon, we have Health and Human Services Policy Group located in the Commissioner's Boardroom, fifth floor of this building. That's 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. And then June uh, 17th, again at 1.30, we have a work session regarding Marion County's personnel rules located in the Commissioner's Boardroom. Again, yeah, the fifth floor of this building. Again, tomorrow, June 17th at 3.30 in the afternoon, we have wildfire season discussion with the American Red Cross located in the commissioner's boardroom on the fifth floor of this building. And then Friday, June 18th at 11 a.m., we have the Association of Oregon County's COVID-19 conference call. On Monday, June 21st at 9 in the morning, oh, I apologize, that's a virtual conference call. Uh, on Monday, June 21st at 9 in the morning, we have management update located in the commissioner's boardroom. That's the fifth floor of this building. On Monday, June 21st, 11 a.m., we have Board of Commissioners Policy Meeting located in the Commissioner's Boardroom on the fifth floor of this building. On Monday, June 21st, at 1 in the afternoon, we have a Board of Commissioners Chief Administrative Officer Meeting with an executive session if needed, pursuant to ORS 192.6602ABDEFHI located in the Commissioner's Boardroom on the fifth floor of this building. On Monday, June 21st, at 3 in the afternoon, we have a Santiam Canyon Wildfire Relief Fund Board Meeting and that's a virtual meeting. On Tuesday, uh, June 22nd at 8.30 in the morning, we have a Community Corrections Board meeting located in the Commissioner's Boardroom on the fifth floor of this building. And on Tuesday, June 22nd at 2 in the afternoon, we have a Marion County Extension 4-H Budget uh, Adoption meeting located in the Commissioner's Boardroom on the fifth floor of this building. Tuesday, June 22nd at 3.45 in the afternoon, we have tea with the Commissioners. Oh, that's good. Mm. Uh, and that's, again, located in the Commissioner's Boardroom on the fifth floor of this building. And then on Wednesday, uh, June 23rd at 9 in the morning, we have a board session located in the center hearing room. That's this room. That's the first floor of this building, 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. And then finally, Wednesday, June 23rd at 2 in the afternoon, we have the East Salem Service District uh, meeting to adopt the budget hearing and a semi-annual regular meeting. Well, wow, that's a mouthful. And that's located in the commissioner's boardroom on the fifth floor of this building. That's 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. All right. This is scheduled. Yeah. It's been better, though. Here, you want to hand those back? Yes. It's, it has been bigger. It's been, I feel like it's been a better schedule the last couple weeks than the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> It's felt like more like a normal job rather than an emergency job. Thank you. Yeah. Summertime. Summertime, a few vacation days. I'm yeah. going to take a vacation, a couple vacation days. <clears throat> take my grandkids I'll go with my grandkids I'm not taking them my daughters are taking them but I'm tagging along to that ha one of the happiest places on earth and that's fabulous Florida <laughs> it's a long trip they're gonna stay like through Saturday I'm not, I'm coming back Monday um, so they're gonna be for a week plus yeah yeah they're <clears throat> We're staying at the resort for like four nights, and then I come home, and then they, they're getting a house. We did that when uh, when both of my girls were married early. They, they had no kid, they had no grandson. They had no children, <laughs> no grandkids. And we did that one time. We went back there for like a week and rented a house and had a couple cars. And, yeah. and the house had a pool and, you know, with the nets around it so the alligators didn't come right. in. That's good. It was because you don't want the alligators. Yeah, it was it was fun, but I I can't do it for ten days. Well, not and and, it, and I was just looking. I think I shared that with you on the way in this morning. I was looking at the weather, and this is the time of year that it's going to be great up at Detroit, and I'm going to miss this weekend. It's going to be beautiful up there. 
Yeah. So. But you're going to be in Florida with your grandkids and your children. For I Father's am. So I am going to. Cool. There's that. You can yeah, have a so I, cool. dull whip for me. I'm going to see my favorite Disney characters, Goofy and Eeyore, because that fits my personality. Uh, Sam totally was agree. Eeyore. Holy totally moly. Agree 100% with that yeah, yeah, assessment. Yeah, yeah. Goofy and Eeyore. <laughs> no, Sam is, uh, Sam is more Eeyore than you are, <laughs> Kevin. Oh, my gosh. So, so I'll never forget um, when I first got appointed, um, Sam would kind of always, you know, kind of puff his chest and, you know, I'm a big deal, right? <laughs> so when I, I went, I, the last time I went to Disney World was, was that trip I was just telling you about with the, the alligator bedding. And I found this, um, is it Gastant? Is in uh, what, what? Yeah, he's in Beauty and the Beast. Beauty yeah, and the Gaston. Beast. Oh, and yeah. he's a really big deal. Yeah, he uses yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, got, I found this T-shirt that says, I'm a really big deal and I had Gaston on it and I yeah. put it in Sam's office. That's pretty good. Because <laughs> what is this? I said, well, you're a really big deal. I was thinking about it. I love that. Yeah. And then the, the last trip, that, well, not the last trip, but the, that Europe trip that I took, I brought us all bicycle ties back. I remember that. Yeah. And Sam even wore his. Yeah, we all wore Which one was day. like, I didn't think he was going to do that. Really? It was a good yeah. sport. You know who my favorite Disney character is? Who? Fievel. Who's Fievel? Fievel goes tale. west. Huh? Mm -hmm. From the American Tale. Well, the, yeah, there was also a, mm -hmm. it's a little mouse that is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Fievel. Why? Because he's a dreamer and he's, I, everything about all the movies that this little mouse plays in is just really, feels kind of like maybe my life. You know, lots of adversity and obstacles and he just has got such a good outlook. I feel like I'm a pretty optimistic person. I absolutely have an attitude. I get that that comes with that, but I'm so optimistic. And this mouse is so optimistic in all the things that it faces in these movies. If you haven't watched it, I would encourage you to go watch The American Tale. My kids like them. I do, yeah. I love it. Plus it's like a musical, like most mm -hmm. Disney movies, but I love it. <laughs> so last weekend they, uh, they, I, I should say, I figured out how to uh, get Corella on Apple TV up at the lake. Uh, the adult version. I fell asleep. <laughs> and they, I said, they go, well, you can, you can watch it. You can watch it. And I go, no, nah, I don't think so. You didn't watch it, huh? No. I, yeah. What? We're talking about how, how you, we're just talking about the, the movie. The Corella? Have mm -hmm. you seen it? No, but we went back and Great movie. That's a great movie. That's a good movie. This Cruella is not a kids movie. That's what. That's what it's I. It's not a kids movie. Have you seen it? No. I watched a few it's minutes of it recently. It is not a kids movie. Okay. I would not. I would not let my daughters, if they were your age, watch it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's a great adult that's movie. Strong. Yeah, I mean, I almost was like, why are my daughters watching this? Yeah, yeah, that's. And they're scary. older. Is it scary or is it? No, it's not scary. It's just adult. scandalous. It's just. It's, sort of it's like. Movie. It's, it bothers me, to be honest, that Disney, I get it, it but they should, they should market it to a large, an older audience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just think that there's underlying messages and behaviors and styles that are not suited for small children. Mm -hmm. the, way I, the way I would like my children to be mm -hmm. engaged and raised. My daughters <laughs> love they sound really crude, the uh, live action Cinderella. The, the, the one with the real people. The remake. Yeah. The remake, they will love it. It's like one of their favorites. I love that movie. <laughs> there's several, There's one with Drew Barrymore I just watched the other day. <laughs> Any, sign me up for Cinderella. <laughs> you know what else? What did we watch recently? Oh, they also, um, The Parent Trap, the original. Yes. So the other day they come to me, because they've seen you know the new one. <laughs> the, the Lindsay remake. Lohan yeah, version. The, right. And they're like, Dad, can we watch the old Parent Trap? We think it's better than the new one. It and is. I was, and I was like, wow, my five year old and my seven year old. Have, have they seen Pollyanna? The original Pollyanna? I don't know if they have. You should yeah, let them watch it. I might be that. letting them down. Yeah, yeah. You are. It's one of my favorite movies from my childhood. I will watch it every day. So, you know what? My favorite movie, I think it was a Disney movie, uh, Old Yeller. Yeah, they we had we read it to them and they watched the movie oh, and they were bawling. Oh, at the end oh my of gosh, I still cry. I so watch it. So sad. Or the or the red fern grows. Or my daughters just asked me the other day if they could watch Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Oh, I don't know if you've shown that. I, I have. I have yeah, a Disney movie. I don't know if I've shown it to them. I have a Disney movie that has been. It is, but it's um, so good. Uh, my daughter's first Disney movie that I took her to in a theater. So she must have been two. 
Uh, we lived in Colorado. You took a two-year-old to a theater? Yeah, because I don't brave. think I don't think Amanda was born yet. So she took a two-year-old to a Timbers two, game. That two, was a mistake. Two, yeah. it, was, <laughs> it was two, two and a half. It was Song of the South. Oh, yeah. And you keep can't her, find it. Can right? you keep her attention? The movie, in yeah. the movie theater. Yeah, and you know they've obviously, you know, it's uh, what do you call it? Not politically correct today, but I had the <laughs> I had the DVD because she goes, Dad. I've tried to watch Song of the South again and I couldn't find it. So I found it on the internet someplace and, and bought the DVD. And so she was like 33 and we watched it again together. And she goes, this was the first movie you took me to? And I go, yeah, it was a cartoon. It was, we'd lived in Colorado and it was like, <laughs> You don't know what the first movie is I saw in the theater? I was eight and my mom's grandma took me up in Wilsonville. Big Business with Bette Midler. Oh. I I've was never, eight. I've never seen it. Yeah. In the, it's not yeah. a movie you would take an eight-year-old to, but I was with her, and that's what she wanted to do. And so I've seen it multiple times since, because it's, it's a great movie as an adult. But, I mean, really? That's my first movie experience. We really like Disney+. Plus, and one of the things that I really like about it is all the cartoons that I watched growing that's up. That's right. Like Tailspin and Dark Duck Tales. Like, and Duck Tales. They're all there, yep. and the girls love them. Yeah. yeah. I was just telling somebody about this the other day, how... This generation of kids really has missed out on a lot of, I think, wonderful te television. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was, I, I vividly remember fifth grade because I'd have to walk. It was like the longest walk of my life from school to home. And when I would get home, there would be the four o'clock, like, babysitting hour. So the after school special would come on. The five, the, mm -hmm. um, the Fraggle Rocks came on. The DuckTales, mm -hmm. the, Chip, the Chip and Dale Chip Brothers. Chip and Rescue Rangers. Yeah, 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 yeah it that's was, a good one. They don't have any of that now. Nothing yeah. for kids to be babysat after school, tell parents to come home on TV that's like educational or inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and somebody goes, the more you know, you know, and like the star that shoots across this TV, mm -hmm. that was after school special. Mm -hmm. Kevin's like, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. I remember, and, uh, wow, well, I'm gonna date myself. <laughs> Wonderful World of Disney on Sunday nights. That's right. With, I used to stay up late and watch Walt, that. Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. With Walt Disney, he passed away, and I want to say he passed away when I was like seven or eight. I don't know when he passed away. There's a great museum if you ever get uh, San Francisco down. Um, it's it's the Walt Disney Museum down. Uh, where's the what's that old military area down by the Golden Gate uh, Bridge? Um, I'll, I'll look it up, but. I took my daughters there for a father-daughter trip. This was back in 2017 and went through this museum. They spent hours in this museum because they're big Disney freaks. And it's about his life and, you know, and all that other stuff and, um, you know, how, how they created Disneyland and all that. You know, and I, I think this is actually really good because at the beginning we started this and we approved the the contract so that kids could get work experience. Yeah. And, it, and this is sort of the other side of the coin, you know, because his story is basically... He had to work, I think, from the age he was like seven or eight or something, right? right? Like really, really hard. And so he, he, you know, basically grew up saying, I want to make sure that kids have a place where they can play and have moments where they can be kids, right? And so it's funny how you have these sort of, I feel like our society kind of swings from one end of the pendulum to the other, right? Where, where you know, when he was growing up, a lot of the kids had to work, work, work and really grind, right? And there wasn't a place for them to be kids. And, he was really a visionary and said, let's, let's make sure that there's a place for, for kids to be kids, right? They don't have to be adults too soon, right, to your point. But now we're in a place where I remember being, my first job was like a bag boy at a grocery store, right? And I remember I was scheduled for like, I don't know, 26 hours a week one some, summer. And I was like, how could anybody work 26 hours in a week? This is so hard, right? <laughs> and uh, I was such, such a weenie. And... And, uh, and I think about that as like there are kids who don't actually have any work experience even up until they go to college, right? right? And it's like really a disability. And so it's one of these things where, you know, it's like a lot of things, you really just want to find that, that middle path where it's sort of like you don't have kids grinding away from six years old and you do have an opportunity for them to be kids. And by the time you're 18, you want to be able to do a 40-hour week and not have it be super overbearing on you, not have it be this crushing thing, but something that... Yeah, you, you grow up and you're comfortable with and you've had some experiences working and um, and so it's funny how we go from one end of the spectrum to the other and, and now we're trying to find that that happy medium again, you know. I love that the community, if they're watching, gets to see us in our kind of 
kind of natural state. This is what this is what we're like. Well, before we get too natural, I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs>